Hello everyone, welcome back to A Tale of Two Cities. In the last episode, Atticus and the Wanderers continued their journey through Eastern Roman lands, raiding several areas including Melitane, where, with the aid of the Alans, the people of Pontus rised up against their Roman overlords and established themselves as an independent kingdom once more. Meanwhile, over in the west, the speedy and the Seekers of Glory cut a bloody path for northern Italy, burning and sacking many places to the ground, and causing a decisive blow to the western Romans by killing not one, but two of their emperors in battle, before finally arriving at their capital, Mediolanum, which the speedy orders to be burned to the ground in <laughs> payment for their hubris against them. In response to this, the survivors of the Senate sent what armies they could to try and deal with the Speedio and the Seekers of Glory, who had been weakened after their attack on Mediolanum. And this is where we left them, and we'll continue with this episode. Although not considered by some modern historians as important as the events that eventually befell Rome, the raising of Mediolanum by the Seekers of Glory sent a shockwave that reverberated through the Western Roman Empire. Established as the capital by Emperor Diocletian in 286 AD, it was a shock for the Western Romans to not only have a hostile force so close to the centre of the empire, but having destroyed their capital as well. The remaining officials and members of the Senate, lost without an emperor as who should be declared next was still unclear, made their way north to the town of Octodurum to set up office there. Messages meanwhile were sent to the survivors of the 3rd Legion, as well as the commander of the 8th, to march against the Seekers of Glory in an attempt to entrap the Alani Horde between both armies. In this episode, we've got a fight to start with between the Speedo and the Seekers of Glory, and the survivors of the 3rd Legion first of all, along with the 8th Legion as reinforcements. While the Speedo waits for his scouts to come back with an idea of the battle map, we're going to check out the enemy force. The Servius Mus is leading the 3rd Legion along with the survive well, I say Legion, the survivors of the last attack, consisting of two units of horsemen. Not that big a deal. In the meantime though, the 8th Legion come in as reinforcements with a strong line of Combatanese spears, and quite interestingly some axe units, including some Nordic axe troops, which I'm not really sure where these army would have got it from, but there you go. They also have a few onagers, which is something I'm going to have to be prepared for in the battle. The map in front of us shows that the battlefield is going to be relatively flat. It, there's a few scattered buildings it looks like, but on the whole relatively f flat. It's perfect ground for my horsemen. As you can see, the Speedio's forces are quite diminished after the attack on Mediolanum, but I still feel pretty confident of victory, despite the fact the balance bar is slightly in their favour. So I'm going to fight this out on the battlefield. As the battle commenced, I deployed my force in a defensive formation with spears at the front and archers in the front of them then ready to attack the enemy as they got closer. And well my swordsmen in the back and my war dogs on the left ready to swoop around the flank, although I actually forgot about them in the end. I also deployed my horsemen up front into two groups in the hope to eliminate the enemy commander as well as the remainders of the 3rd Legion before the reinforcements came onto the battlefield. I was quite surprised to see a couple of their units though, if I zoom in just quickly now. You see that some of them have managed to pick up some steppy raiders along the way, as well as a unit of Germanic mounted warband they no doubt levied from some passing horde along the way. Now, I was expecting, that, to be fair, the <laughs> reinforcements to start coming in from the, the rear behind to support them. So I moved my horsemen up to try and eliminate them as quickly as possible before the reinforcements arrived. However, as you can see, the, I get the notification that the reinforcements have arrived, but instead of being where I was hoping they were going to, they actually turned up to the left, uh, sorry, to the right of the Speedio's line. This is quite the bad situation though for the force. What? The other Roman army arrives on our right flank? Where's that bastard of a... Yes, you there! Get over here! You were the one who reported this army coming in. How could you forget to mention that this army was behind us this whole time? Get out of my sight! I will deal with you later, mark my words. My god, why did Agaros have to get himself injured and leave me with these incompetent morons in the meantime? He better get himself better soon, otherwise there's going to be trouble. Men, turn to face the right flank and give these Romans a warm welcome. As their reinforcements make their way onto the battlefield, I was originally too caught up in the horsemen to realise what was going on. But I quickly put my army then into grouped formation and uh, got them to face the oncoming reinforcements. In the meantime then, my cavalry charge into the survivors of the 3rd Legion. 
But despite the fact that all the horsemen, both mine and theirs, are suffering from casualties in previous battles, I've got sheer quantity on my side in terms of six units of horsemen, as well as quality with the more experienced. So this shows us very quickly the enemy raiders, the steppe raiders, actually rout from the battle completely, while the other Germanic warbands actually try to retreat ready to make some sort of counter charge. But my other unit you know, of horsemen charge into them and really quickly rout them. Servilius Cavilius most and his Palatina guard fight violently, but very quickly they have started to retreat as well. Unfortunately there is no escape from them. My horsemen are swarming around them in an attempt to kill off as many of them as I can. And it's just a matter of time before Cavilius Mills is actually killed, impaled on the end of a cataphract's lance. This really puts me in a good advantage though, as despite the fact the reinforcement army has a lot larger unit compared to the Seekers of Glory, with their leader dead, the morale <laughs> boost is now in my favour and it should be very quickly and easy to get them to retreat. A little bit later into the battle, I finally moved my cavalry into position in order to try and charge the enemy onagers. The last thing I wanted, given my weakened force, for their onagers to try and take pot shots at my own infantry. The only thing was though is that I realised very quickly that I was actually within range of them with my cavalry, so it was a case of trying to get them to charge in with onager shots pouring down on top of them. Fortunately though, the faster cavalry units were able to try and get in, but as you can see from the view of the, my Salmation Cataphracts, a couple of my horses took hits from the enemy's honor stones. Fortunately though, despite the barrage coming over them, we didn't lose too many casualties. You can look behind and see there's a couple of horsemen in the distance, but otherwise we managed to charge through, much like I imagine that many infantry did during the Battle of Normandy. At this point though, my cavalry managed to catch up with them. And very quickly the Onager crew is slaughtered and forced to rout. Although I was very surprised to see that none of the enemy army actually decided to come out and help, which meant that it was a very quick process of eliminating the Onagers and they're no longer a factor in the battle, which is always a good thing. Speaking of Onagers then and doing damage, by the time this time though the enemy army started to get into range and as you can see my Onagers started pounding down across them. That particular unit you know, on the left there highlighted just now is really taking some damage from my flaming onagers. Their heavy armor, despite being heavy spear infantry, is no real match against a giant rock coming down and exploding from fire all around you. Okay. At this point, as you can see, then, the enemy cavalry started to come up to try and deal with mine because I tried to be subtle and put them into the tree line ready to attack the enemy uh, army from behind. Fortunately though, despite the fact these horse units are still relatively full strength, my horsemen are more than capable of dealing with them. The only problem is though, their equites actually block off a huge amount of the second group that was actually heading to try and deal with the skirmishing units. So it meant that I was only able to get one unit through, and despite the quality of my troops, they've still got to deal with them <laughs> with sheer numbers. The enemy army is starting to get closer and closer, as you can see, my onage is still pottering shots at them, and at this point my archers are starting to take some hits against them. Unfortunately though, they're not doing that much damage. Heading back into the horsemen, as you can see, the skirmishers actually did a very good job against my, the unit of horsemen and actually attacked them. But since I managed to rout that scout equities unit, all my horsemen charge into the skirmishing cavs to try and deal with them. It wasn't as effective as I would have liked, truth be told, but the amount of, well, amount of numbers facing them forced the enemy's skirmishing cav to retreat pretty quickly and allows me to try and bring them back up then. Back with the main army, the arm, as you can see, the enemy starting to engage. I was actually shocked to see these mercenary Nordic axes throwing heavy axes at my spear wall. Just the sheer amount of axes and all that blood on the floor from my steppy levy. I was actually really surprised that this happened. But fortunately though, the axe unit decided to go for the more heavily bigger unit that was being attacked by some spearmen already. I charged my Sarmatian warbands in just to try and uh, help the situation in the center and deal with those spearmen. And the speed heal gives a shout for his spear wall to hold their shields up and hold the enemy in place, uh, increasing their melee defense in the process. As you can see then, on the left flank, um, left of the screen I should say, my horsemen are now starting to charge in. The enemy has already started to retreat thanks to the morale penalties facing losing their commander. And it's very quickly done that my, the enemy starts to retreat piece by piece. 
I'll bring in other units then, such as the summation warband, to try and deal with the survivors. But yes, it's very quickly done and dusted. Enemies starting to rout all over the place. And it's just a matter then of mopping up the enemy and trying to kill off as many as they can before they retreat off the map so I don't have to deal with them at another time. At the end of the battle, I got a decisive victory. Very good news, considering the balance bar was originally against me a bit. And I didn't lose many casualties in the process, so I was hoping for a heroic victory, but I'm not going to complain. Anyway, that's the end of the battle, and I'll see you back on the campaign map. Back on the campaign map, we're just in time to see the Speedios hack the head of Cavilius Mus. And as you can see from the battle reports, the battle went really well. I only lost 83 men out of my army, compared to the enemy's forces who have only got 51 remaining. A huge victory really for the Speedy on the Seekers of Glory, although as you can see we've taken a couple of casualties across the board, especially in one unit's Steppy Levy as well as one of my units of Horsemen, but thankfully no, none of the units actually got killed. In return we managed to completely eliminate the 3rd Legion, and as well as that for the 8th Legion, there's only got a couple of people, there's only one unit that managed to make it out, a unit of Comitanisa Spears. Fortunately though we didn't wipe them all out completely, it means they'll be able to get a new commander pretty soon. And having a look for the options, as tempted as it might be to take on the warriors, I only would have had 2% replenishment. And I wouldn't have got much money from ransoming them back, so I just went ahead and killed the captives. Thing. The survivors went off and entered the south, and the Seekers of Glory left alone for the rest of the turn. At the start of my turn I get the news that both enemy commanders were killed by the Seekers of Glory during the end turn phase as well as an offer by a local mercenary commander called Aldis to, for his, to offer his men in return for money. No doubt the speeder will be pretty interested to hear about this and given his smooth tongue trait should hopefully be able to negotiate a good deal. We also get the news of course that Kodan was also becoming a companion. And according to the event messages, rumours have hit Atticus that the Himyar have declared war on the Sassanids. Uh, while the Speedio hears of the Markamans declaring war on the Western Romans, there seems that the number of enemies of the Western Romans is slowly increasing. Now with the Seekers of Glory, I need to try and replenish their numbers a bit using local people from the Horde as well as perhaps any local people that might join. I didn't want to keep them around the ruins, but I did spy that Genua is actually under command of the Vandals, my military ally. So I decided to see if they'd be willing to actually let me stay there. Unfortunately though, the 8th Legion survivors have turned up. They actually got one unit of Comitanisa Spears, the survivors from that one, as well as a new commander, Septimius Marula. Fortunately though, they're not really much of a threat for me, so given the reinforcements coming from Genua as well, the 8th Legion is pretty driven off. And in the meantime, Speedio speaks to the Vandals, asking for permission to settle there and a chance to replenish the army. Please, rest for a moment when I consider my answer to your king. Tell your king that I, Godajiso, king of the Vandals, respect the terms of our alliance and offer him and his people permission to enter my lands to rest and recover. My town is open for his people to gain fresh supplies and I look forward to hunting with him as we did in the days of old. <laughs> tell him, tell him that this time you will not win the hunt by spooking my horse and pretending it was a wild animal. Before you go, please enjoy the hospitality of my hall tonight. The meat is hot, there's plenty to drink, and plenty of company to keep you warm this night should you wish. With go to Jesus permission and the Seekers of Glory in camp outside Genua, this allows the Horde to gain new supplies from the town after being forced to forage and hunt for so long. And also allows me to boost the replenishment rate of the Seekers as they have a friendly area for them to be able to retrain new recruits. I also decided in the meantime as well to get a new unit of Sarmatian Warband. Their swords have been pretty effective against the spear-heavy Roman armies I've faced so far, so another unit can't do the Seekers any harm. I take the opportunity as well then to sort out the equipment for the Speedio. It seems he's picked up a barbarian slave girl along his travels, which increases the melee attack and morale of his bodyguard. A suit of legionary patera armor from the ruins of Mediolanum, which decreases recruitment costs as well as upkeep costs by a massive 10%. I'm gonna take that. 
And he's also picked up a Pamas shield. This increases the armor for the commander's unit and also allows me to train melee infantry recruits in how to use their shield better and take less damage from missile attack, which is a, really a good thing considering the amount of shields I've got. It's only a shame that I have to wait a little while before I can actually train them properly. Next bit to do is to sort out Aldis, where given the fact that the speedy was quite the arrogant smooth talker, I decided to go in st straight away and ask for a discount. Hopefully this will allow me, if I have to, to be able to get cheaper mercenaries uh, thing for either him or the Wanderers. Over in the east, Lepoxus is continuing his journey through the assassinate lands, in the attempt to try and find out more about the lay of the land as well as the composition of their forces. We do see at Arbella that there is an army stationed there, the Fires of Victory. Apart from the fact they're quite a strong army with 17 units, I'm not sure what the composition is. We do come across though their king leading the charge of fire. Now I was quite surprised to see it was this guy Crosswell. I was expecting it to be the guy with the funny hat, but <laughs> never mind. Um, we also come across another small army that's recently been damaged. Maybe they've been dealing with the Himyar down in the south. Who knows at this point? Going back to the Wanderers then, the first thing I noticed is the fact that Pontus is starting to send an army towards Amida. Now, I'm not going to complain too much if the Sons of Ares want to try and capture it, but I do want to make sure there's land in the area for myself, since I've got plans of coming over here in the future. After having a look through the diplomacy screen, I was quite surprised to see the Huns are actually very friendly with me, considering the fact that Vespedio doesn't like them. I was surprised to see it, but there you go. I decided though to try and sort out a couple of allies if possible. The Ostrogoths are near the Allen, so they're open to for a non-aggression pact. The Subians nearby are also open for a non-aggression pact. Thankfully going to war against the two Roman empires has done a pretty good task for me so far. I went decided to speak to Gaul as well. And despite the fact they're actually stronger than me, they actually really want some sort of alliance or treaty with me. So I decided after <laughs> fudging around trying to hit the white buttons that I could actually get a military alliance with them. And they were actually were going to offer me money as well, which is always a nice thing. I did want to push my luck though, I only asked for 600 and they accepted. So my small list of allies is growing and growing. Fame. The fact they're reliable, defensive, diplomatic and culturally tolerant is also a good thing. We go back then to the Sassanids where I was thinking about it and I decided I'm actually going to go ahead and declare war on them. I actually want Pontus to expand other areas since I do think about maybe trying to colonize down near the coast of Syria or something. So I need a set have some enemy in the area which isn't, I would like to keep Armenia around. But I need someone to actually come down and start doing damage elsewhere. So I decided that the Fire of Victory led it will be a good war target for Pontus and that. Maybe they'll go down and attack. Who knows? You can see my little, the little eagle there to show where the war target is. And I just wanted to double check then that it was actually the army and not the town I was actually targeting. So... The Shah Hashan has decreed that we must prepare to march against the barbarians from the north that have come to our lands. Although he has said that these Alani are nothing and will be swept aside by our might, I have heard differently. My brother is a merchant that sells spices to the north and has told me that these Alani have overcome the northern kingdoms and have sworn them over as vassals. They take what they wish from the Romans without any response and even raise the king over the people of Pontus. These Alani might be barbarians, but they play the game of war well for barbarians. With the diplomacy you're dealt with, then I sent the wanderers towards their next target, the city of Edessa. Now, the garrison is a bit stronger, but nevertheless, the balance of power is in my favor. I just need to actually get in first. I decided out of the siege equipment that going for battling rams again will be the best option. The sheer amount of horsemen I will have meant that in the army attacks, that being able to bash down the gates will allow me to bring my horsemen and deal with the situation very quickly. Finally, Lena, there's not much else I can actually do for my turn, so I went ahead and ended it. At the start of my next turn, I get the news that Adalis, the mercenary commander, was very impressed with speedy or smooth words and sharp wit, and was happy to offer a special raid for his men. Unfortunately though, this isn't going to really be that much of use, since both the Seekers of Glory and the Wanderers happen to have a full stack. 
but it'd be something to bear in mind in case I need it. We also go for the event messages. It seems that Agalos has now returned to duty, something Bespedio no doubt is happy to hear. And unfortunately, Laypox has been exposed. Maybe the Sassanids have been paying more attention to foreigners since them, our declaration of war on them. Going then to the battle at Odessa, the balance bar is very much in my favour. In fact, it's really in my favour. Maybe down to the fact that I used Banning Rams who haven't in the towers. And I decided it was just worth an auto resolve on protective stance to try and save the lives of my men. I did take a few more casualties though than I would have liked. 144 men lost, mainly from the sword, well, spear units, although a couple of my horsemen as well as my dogs were hurt. But it was a victory nevertheless. I could have liberated the faction once more, I decided just to go ahead and sack the town again so I can get a nice sum of money from them. At this fact, I've got quite a bit of money, 20,308, so I'm not complaining there. In order to try to figure out then where to take the Wanderers next then, I sent Lepoxus to join up with the Wanderers once more. Not only will he be able to report back to Atticus about the layabout, layout of the enemy's forces, but also be able to find out what's going on with the fire of victories, that big strong army and whereabouts it is. In fact, he can't seem to find it anywhere, so that nearby Sassanid town does seem like a likely target. But first of all, I want to take him back to Amida, where I hope Pontus actually captures next turn, so I can try and replenish my men a little bit before continuing the war against the Sassanids. Over on the west of the map, Agaros is now back at duty, something that Vespedo is very happy to hear after the failure of his replacement scouts at the Battle of Mediolanum. And we're surprised to see in the meantime that Gaul has actually attempted to recolonize Mediolanum. Thanks to the mod, this happens very quickly, something I'm really happy to see, especially since the AI doesn't cost them anything to actually uh, recolonize areas. And I send Agaros in the meantime then down to the wars Aqua Sexte and have a look to see what's going on. I still can't see any Roman armies, maybe I eliminated a lot of them thanks to the Seekers of Glory fame. Although we do notice a couple of things such as the large army of the Vandals that have now seem to have appeared. I don't remember seeing them in the last turn. And with my forces now relatively in thing, I decided to move them slightly closer to the Genua's borders with the Subians, just so I can continue again at the extra replenishment. And it also gave me time to retrain the men with this new sh shield ability. So now they've got a nice little bronze chevron in shield crafting. So I'm not going to complain too much about that. I do have a look now to see if there's anything I could do in terms of building up the horde buildings, but I'm trying to save my money for a while because I'm hoping to settle down soon and just go ahead and end the turn. During the end turn phase, we do see the fires of victory heading northwards now towards the Sassanids, as well as the mages trying to deal something to Lepoxus. Fortunately, though, it doesn't seem to have done anything, so I'm not going to complain too much. Later on in the end turn phase, Pontus have offered a, a marriage between Mado and their emperor, Virilius Axis Mergis. It seems he's taken quite a fancy to her and has offered numerous times to pay money for her. Thing is, I wanted a little bit more for, than 600 for her, I thought she was worth more than that. So I decided to try and go for 800. Unfortunately though, they refused the offer and that, the marriage didn't take place. At the start of my final turn for this episode, I get some good news. The Sassanid Magus that tried to distract the Apoxus fortunately failed, and a Western Roman spy that tried to misdirect the Seekers of Glory also failed. I don't know about you, I always like seeing it when <laughs> the enemy agents fail in their missions. I also get a situation come up when some Beda is trying to promote himself to the rank of Companion. I decided to let him do it. It can only help me out, to be fair, and... I don't mind the minus 4% control, I've still got a pretty high domination level at this moment in the hordes. So, with this video on the Seekers of Glory, we do get some bad news. Alcor Sexte is actually under siege by the Subians. That's really annoying, because I wanted to attack them. But, we're going to deal with them instead. We're not going to, we're going to try and march by, hopefully not accidentally clicking on the Subians and declaring war on them. Since, not since I got a non-aggression pact with them. But I'm simply going to move the Seekers of Glory within range of the town and encamp them. So if the Serbians decide to attack, we could always offer ourselves as reinforcements. Otherwise, I'm pretty happy just to allow them to encamp. And so they're not going to be blocked by the zone of control and they can continue on their journey afterwards. 
Uh, Garros, because of the fact that I've got several agents trying to hustle me, or at least one, maybe two I can see on the map, I decided to move Agaros into the Seekers of Glory, where his scouting ability should hopefully deter any agents from trying to do any successful actions in them in the future anyway. Okay. There's nothing really else I can do, unfortunately. We're pretty close to our destination. As you can see, this is the mountains that border, well, separate Spain from the rest of the Europe. So we're pretty close to objective of the Seekers of Glory. So they'll be happy to be there for a little while longer. Over in the east, the Wanderers, I was debating about it for a little bit, and I decided I was going to get the Wanderers to attack Nisibis. But before that, I wanted to try and deal with this army, the Fires of Victory. Or Fire of Victory, I should say. Is it Fire or Fires? I'm not sure. I'll check in a second. But yes, I did try to get Lopoxis to misdirect the army, and it was successful. Oh, Wastram's Companions, my mistake. <laughs> I got the names mixed up. And it is a full 20 stack, but unfortunately though, they are got a pretty far movement range. In fact, they might still be able to re attack me later on anyway. So first of all, I decided nevertheless, I'm going to go after Nisibis and hopefully be able to retreat back afterwards, depending on how the situation goes. Fortunately though, I'm stuck in a zone of control from Amida and I have to actually attack. Although thanks to my Pontus allies, they, we may, had very few casualties, only 5 men was lost in the attack. Thing. So I was actually able to get a little bit more money from sacking the town and then I'm going to continue on the attack towards Nisibis. I have to admit the garrison was a little bit larger than I expected. Thing. They actually had over, nearly over 800 men against my 900. But I figured if I can go in and attack I can sack the town and then quickly leave or at least get far away enough that even if the uh, companions decide to attack I can actually retreat. So, as you can see, the balance bar is relatively in my favour, but not as a hell of a lot, so I will be taking control myself. But we will be continuing this battle in the next episode of A Tale of Two Cities. The Sassanid Empire to this point was faced with very few adversaries. Their strong position in the East meant that to many their only true adversary was the Eastern Roman Empire. Two beasts that rarely eyed the other waiting for the opportunity to attack while the other was unprepared. The arrival of the Wanderers originally tipped the balance in favour of the Sassanids, who sources say actually looked favourably towards the Alani people due to their attacks against Roman settlements. The declaration of war by Atticus against them surprised many, although it is suspected that the war was designed to avert Atticus's allies and Pontus towards another target, or leaving land for him to conquer. Meanwhile, Vespudio and the Seekers of Glory continued unheeded by the Romans, who given the number of men reports said were lost against the Seekers along with the damage done is not surprising. The remains of the Senate, along with their new Emperor had learned wisely from the previous encounters, and given their other troubles and the many factions seeking land from them, felt that it was best to allow this dangerous army to simply pass by. For some, given what was taken as tribute, presented a better solution in attempting to march against these proven warriors and step instead. <laughs> 